Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshiks mainframe channel. This is Moshiks. A couple of videos ago I made a video about useful Linux commands for mainframers and that went through well and then one of the viewers left a comment on, below that video on YouTube saying well yeah but I think most people are Linux users and they want to know um, how to get things done on ZOS on the, on the mainframe. And that actually gave me a great idea. And finally, I had the time today to sit down and go through that a little bit. So what we're going to look at today is some, if you're a Linux user and you're used to getting things done on Linux, how would you accomplish those same things on ZOS, on the, on the mainframe? And maybe later on, I will also have a next video, which is accomplishing Linux tasks on ZVM. And I think because the two operating systems are... Uh, are uh, different enough that you want to explain those things separately but also because Linux runs uh, on the mainframe best on the ZVM so I think it makes also sense to have a video about that and maybe I'll make uh, the next video is going to be about that but today we're going to be focusing on you are a Linux user and you want to get things done on ZOS so what I did here is I have a I have a, a shell um, open here, uh, I'm SSH connected to a Linux machine uh, in this window and here with a 3270 uh, terminal I'm connected to a, a mainframe, a real mainframe out at the University of Leipzig in Germany uh, with a ZOS 2.1. Now everything I'm going to show in this video is really version independent, it doesn't matter which distribution of Linux you use, I'm really not fond of all this distribution discussions, I'm not going to get into that at all because they're all very, very similar. And also, I'm not going to get into the version of ZOS they're running, whether you run ZOS 2.1, which is slightly maybe a little older uh, version here, maybe two, three years old, but that doesn't matter. They're all very, very similar. Uh, the newest version of ZOS is 2.3, and the university is going to upgrade soon to that um, to that version. But everything that I'm going to show you is going to be, if you take it back 10 years, 20 years, maybe even 30 years, those same commands will work exactly the same for both Linux and for and for ZOS. Obviously Linux didn't exist, exist 30 years ago, but uh, maybe 25 years ago it did exist. So both operating systems are not young anymore. And so, um, but a lot of people, especially developers in the uh, uh, de developing cloud applications nowadays, they do stuff on Linux, especially if it's in the cloud. And now and then, as more and more people discover the power of Linux on the mainframe and the power of the mainframe operating systems, um, and uh, if they find out that the mainframe is becoming great again, uh, they want to they want to be able to navigate a little bit in, on the mainframe and get some things done. So uh, we're going to start with the very easy things and then move on to more complex things. Before I go there, though, one more thing I want to say, and that is, Linux does one thing and ZOS does a different thing. You will find out that not always uh, you can map every command to a, a a similar command on the mainframe. Some things are not possible to do in one and are possible in the other. And that's because they were not meant to do the same thing. They were not uh, created the same way. They were not designed with the same assumptions. And so uh, it doesn't mean that because you can do one command in Linux and you can't do it in ZOS, that ZOS sucks and vice versa. Uh, and they just have different things. The other thing is that the, uh, the, the a lot of the commands that we use in Linux concern with the file system. And the file system in ZOS is very very different. The third thing I'm going to say is that uh, there is a Unix in ZOS called USS and we're not going to look at that at all. Uh, most commands that we're going to do for Linux would work very very similarly under the USS Unix system services for ZOS but that's not what we're concerned with here today. We're concerned with the ZOS uh, where people are a little bit more unfamiliar. So those three things, please keep in mind. And so let's start with the most simple thing. I think everybody, when they log in into a Linux box or Unix, from you know, same thing, they would start with doing an ls, right? An ls is list command. So how do we do an ls uh, in ZOS? And most people are right there are surprised <laughs> how how different the list or uh, listing of of uh, file systems contents is. On ZOS okay and so let's let's look at this right now so on ZOS the right side here 
if I want to look at the content of a file system, I, I usually will go here into option three, where all the uh, where all the utilities are. Okay, so that will be called the utility. So you go there, three dot four, and you go to three dot four, and and then um, I either have to tell them uh, a first the first qualifier. So every data set. So what, what's called the file here on Linux is called the data set on the, on the ZOS on the mainframe. And all data sets will start with some kind of high level qualifier. It's kind of like in, in the MS-DOS days where you have eight bytes or eight characters in front for a file and three behind like command.com, right? So kind of like that. So all the, all the files have to start with a high level qualifier and then you can have up to 44 you can have you know something like this moshakes dot uh, backups uh, uh, private files right so each one of this would be uh, would be a a qualifier but the high level qualifier would be the first part and so when you want to list the, the, the contents of a disk you kind of have to go either by name so I can do moshakes here and then it will show me all the Moshix files that the system knows of that are in the directory and the catalog, wherever, whatever disks they are. As you can see here, some disks called SMS07, some other called 2210702, some are called SMS. So it doesn't, as long as it, they're in the catalog and they don't have to be, right? This is one big difference. In Linux and, and, Win, and Windows, whenever you create a file, touch Moshix file, it will automatically be added to the directory. So if I look for Moshix, it will find it like this, right? That is not so in, in ZOS. F files can be put on a disk and don't have to be cataloged. Um, so that's why the listing is so much more complex, right? And that's why I want to start with this right away because that's where a lot of people get lost. So uh, as long as the as as file data sets are cataloged, I can search them by the, uh, the high level qualifier, Moshix, and we'll find them wherever they are. I can also search for the second qualifier. Let's see here, for instance, I have IMON. As you can see, I have two data sets IMON. Uh, so I could also search like this, IMON. And then it tells me, do you really want to search that because it's a complex operation? And it finds all the um, IMON data sets uh, that exist in the system, even the ones that don't belong to me. Okay, so there's a user here, PRAC, they must have uh, watched one of my videos and they uploaded the IMON um, system monitor uh, for their own use. It could also be installed so that everybody could use it, but uh, in this system, I'm not a system administrator. That's, by the way, one more restriction for this video. Whereas here, of course, I am root, right? Uh, as you can see here, I'm root. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, uh, if I you know, if I want to see all the files, right, which is something that you rarely would do on Linux anyway, right, then that's something you can't do, right? I cannot just list all the files on all the disk splatters that I have. That's something that would be, you would have to use a utility uh, for that in batch, but online, um, interactive, there's really no way to do this. I can do something like this, SMS002, we saw there's a disk called like that, and then I can put in the volume here and then we'll list all the files that exist on that disk. Okay, so, but what I cannot do is show all the files for all disks, um, which is something that you really don't want to do because what's the purpose in that? It's similar to Linux. Why would you list all the files on all the disks that you have? You usually want to work with those files that you're concerned with. So that's, that would be the LS, right? Now, um, uh, who uh, am I, right? Is a, is a command where I want to know who, who I'm logged in as right now. That is something that on the mainframe doesn't exist like that. You can write programs and I have some videos on this channel where I show, um, I wrote some assembler programs that show you who you are logged in as. But um, there's not a command like that. But however, if you go to the top level ISPF, which is the interactive um, panels here that you can see, um, when you go to the top level, you can see here I'm logged in as Moshix here, okay? So uh, there's no command just like that, although you can create your own command, but you can see it from here. Um, 
then of course time uh, date will tell you here on, uh, on Linux the date February 2nd and the time um, here you have it uh, here on t uh, in, in this in this field here you can also go here to options and uh, there is a way to show the calendar I haven't done this in years yeah here three calendar so now uh, whenever you're here you can also see the calendar you have the whole calendar in front of you you're on day 33 of the year so those are some very first few commands um, now some things that you may want to also do is in Linux I often very often have to look at the um, want to look at the log files to see what's going on so I'll do tail var um, log and then we have a bunch of logs here but we do syslog for instance okay and so this shows me the system log which we also have in in, um, in ZOS and MBS by the way everything I'm going to say for ZOS also applies for MBS and so you can see here this just prints commands how do we do that now this is one of the most important things here there is the panel that we see here is just the top panels there's more panels here so I can just put the mouse here the, the cursor and go there oops or I just type M and then SD and then I can do I can do log I'm actually not allowed to do a log on this system, but if you were um, if you were a, an authorized user, then you could now look at the log. Unfortunately, on this uh, university system, I'm just a normal user. I don't have any system privileges. Um, I, I could ask for it, and I'm sure they would give it to me, but it doesn't really matter. But the, here you would have log, and then you go to log, and you can see the log just as we would have here. Okay. So um, now the creation of files. Here I would just use the world's best editor. Let's say I want to create a new file called Moshik's um, favorite movies, right? So I will do. I would invoke the world's best editor, which we all know is Vim. Moshik's uh, prefer favorite movies, and then I will put in here uh, stuff like. The matrix one, two, and three a little bit less. That maybe I'll put in here um, Ronin and some other movies. Okay, now how will we accomplish this? How do we create a file and edit it in ZOS? Well, there's several ways to do that. Let's go again to the top level and we're going to go to the edit. Okay, so. Uh, sub menu we go to and then i'm going to go here i can create um so i would have to create now a file unfortunately the editor doesn't create files on the fly because file creation is not in implicit in zos as it is in linux right and unix and, and also windows if i create say vim here in this case vim uh, dot whatever this file doesn't exist right now but it will create it and so file creation is implicit in linux it's not in zos so if we want to create edit the file we have to go create it now uh, to do that we have to go again to utilities right to go three and then uh allocate that's called creation is allocation <laughs> that's the way zos zos sometimes has different names for the same things on linux so creation of a file is called allocation so let's go here to allocation and I allocate a new file uh, or data set and I want to call it Moshik's favorite uh, movies and it says okay it, it's proposing here to put it on this disk SMS001 it's because it means it's uh, managed storage uh, I let it and then he wants to know how big the file is going to be so that's one more difference in Linux it just creates on the go as far as much as you want to write into it whereas in ZOS you have to decide at the beginning how large you want the file to be and you can make it so that it can grow a little bit more if it's not if, if it's using all the uh, primary allo allocated space but once all the second secondary 
allocated space is used, that's it, the file cannot grow any longer. So you need to do a little bit more planning on ZOS because that's a production environment that's running for running central applications. And so versus Unix and Linux that come from a distributed systems environment um, kind of uh, philosophy, right? So I need to know how many tracks or cylinders or megabytes or bytes I want it to be. So um, the mainframe organizes sizes still in tracks. Or a track would be one circular track on a platter. Um, so uh, modern disks have 54 kilobytes per track and older disks at 47 and, and, and etc and less and less but so i could have a track which is about 54 kilobytes uh, or i could have a cylinder which is uh, about one megabyte or i could specify also a megabyte so let's do the easier thing here and let's specify the megabyte i want to have one megabyte with one secondary megabyte so if the first one is used it can go grow one more and then no directory blocks uh, and I'll get to that in a second, but the record format. So in ZOS is a record oriented operating system, meaning that the operating system is aware of the structure of the records inside the files, inside the data sets. And when, so when you allocate the data set, when you create a data set, you have to specify what kind it is. So I could have fixed uh, non-blocked or fixed blocked, which means that uh, this is a fixed length of record. Okay, the rec all the records are gonna be the same length and they're going to be blocked, meaning that uh, they are allocated one block at a time. And so because we say um, blocked, we have to say, and fixed, we have to say how long, let's say 80 bytes, okay? That's how 80 characters long. And that is a traditional size. And where does this come from? Right from the punch cards. Punch cards were 80 bytes long, and we still see all of this. And of course, the first monitor sizes back in the, in the PC era and the 3270 monitors, terminals in, in 34 years ago they were all 80 bytes long why because the punch cards are 80 bytes long and now because we said it's blocked here as you can see we say block it wants to know well if it's blocked how many records in a block so let's say i want to do 24,000. okay um and and that's all i need to specify as if and then i i can just say what kind it is i can just leave it empty in this case um, and it's going to create now this data set with one megabyte uh, size. Okay, so you have here the status of the request data set allocated. So we know it's called moshix.favorite.movies. Okay, I can just copy this now with uh, control C. And I can now go to the editor and I go here, other partition. So I don't want to use this. Um, information. I'm going to use the information that I provide. And that's it. Now we're inside the editor. And this is the world's second best editor. The, world for the best editor is Vim. The second, the world's second best editor is the ISPF editor, as everybody knows. So I can do rest, for reset for getting, taking this things here away. And so now I say input mm, eight lines, insert eight lines, and I can say the matrix run in um, I don't know um, stuff like that um, was it I'm the dude what's the movie called with I'm the dude uh, the big Lebowski the big Lebowski um, and other such movies okay now I'm not going to go into uh, how the editor works because uh, that's, that would be a whole different video and I have some videos about it how the editor works if you go look for um, I, the video about how to use MVS uh, 3.8 for beginners on Windows there's a, there's a video I made in this channel you can go look for it if you want uh, where is my browser from Okay, so let's go to YouTube and let's search Moshix, uh, MVS for beginners. So in M44, I explain how the ISPF editor works kind of. So I'm not gonna go into that here, but um, so this is how it's gonna work if you wanna make it all caps on. A lot of things are still uh, bigger uppercase and mainframe world. I can now say, the mm, matrix 2 although it's not my one of my favorite movies so you can see it makes this now automatically uh, uppercase if I want to make everything uppercase I can do with UC 
you see and now everything oops and now this is all going to be uppercase okay um, the matrix 2 is not really a favorite movie so i have i will have to have to delete that um, save will save it okay so we just edited a a program now um or a file if i actually want this to be a c program uh, i would have to of course first reset and now i could say caps off because c is lowercase delete 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 for a block to be deleted and now i can start to say um, include standard io and and then i can say and 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 then can start and write my program okay um, i can also even tell the editor highlight c that this is a c program and so it starts to highlight to syntax highlighting um, I can I cannot leave it like that. I have to I have to finish the program. I, as a program, I cannot leave stuff like that. So int a return zero. Okay. So this would be a very simple C program. I don't even think we need the include here because we're not using printf. But uh, well. Okay. Oops. Main, not main. Um, okay, so we just wrote a simple program. So that's it. Um, that's the editor. Now, let's see if I want to see who's logged in. I will do who here, and then it shows I'm the only person logged in. And it turns out in MBS it's a little bit more complicated. Um, I can't just see just like that who's logged in, but um, there's ways to do that. So let's go again to um, additional IBM products, M as the and then i can see do da active users however you have to have a permission to see all the processes or 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 address spaces as they're called in mainframe te uh, terminology to for me to see all the other users so i can't really uh, i cannot see i can only see myself right what is called the process here like this right this is a process and this is a process they're called address spaces in the in the mainframe world um, so if you're a privileged user, you'll be able to see all the others. However, there's ways to go around that. So I, for instance, have um, this uh, monitor program, Moshix, uh, here, and I run the monitor. And now I can go to G, and I will be able to see now all the other users, right? Um, TSU. TSU are users, so Moshix is logged in, and I don't see anybody else. So right now I'm the only user. You can see there's an HTTP server, the TCP IP address space, or process is running, um, the terminal server is running, etc. Okay, so that is how you could see other users. I have two, it shows me have, there's two CPUs in this machine. Now, how do I do something like HTOP, or more, a lot of people know top better? So this is also how you would do uh, top, right? You would go either use this uh, monitor here, which is not part of ZOS. It's just something you can obtain from free from Prycroft in Australia, an amazing developer, and then you install it very easily. And they have a video about it in the in the channel. Um, or you could also go here again, M SDSF, which is the spool search and display facility. And again, you could see here with DA uh, display active jobs. If you were authorized, you could see all the all the address spaces. Very similar to this. Uh, and in fact, let me see if I can connect to a system where I actually I am a uh, system administrator, so we can have a little bit more um, in where where the video is going to be more uh, information informational for you. In just a second. Okay, folks. So I'm back, and uh, now I'm logged into a system where I am. A full system administrator or system programmer as it's called in mainframe terminology and so let's go again to SDSF so here the menu looks slightly different but I can go here now and I can do DA and this is similar to the top 
um, program on Linux or Unix that shows me all the address spaces. Right? I can also do it like this here, uh, htop, maybe a little bit better. So you can see here, htop shows me all the programs, all the, and these are all processes that are running. Some are tasks inside processes, but um, and I can just scroll down and you can see there's many, many processes and uh, tasks running. Same here, right? So uh, here I have, I can see everything that's running. I also see that I am the only user logged in, I think, right now. Where's Moshix? Uh, I don't even see. Uh, I don't even see. Ah, here it is. Moshix. So I'm currently the only user logged in. And so before we looked at this, at the log, and here now we have, I'm authorized to look at the log. And you can see here, um, this is the log. And uh, it's very similar to the log that would have on Linux. It just shows everything that happens. I can go to very top and then find out when the system was IPL'd. Um, so let's do it like this. So this was uh, December 216. So that would mean somewhere uh, probably in September, October last year, uh, which is the same as doing uptime. Okay, uptime shows me this has been up for 28 days and this has been up maybe for 45 days or so. Uh, ZOS systems very rarely need to be IPL. They can stay up much, much longer, although of course Linux also has great uptime. Although I would have to say that in the recent years, uh, the kernel of Linux has become so big and so much stuff has been added to it. And frankly, a lot of it junk that uh, the uptime is not what it used to be. I used to have systems 10 years ago, 15 years ago that were up for three, four, five, six years. Um, some of them I forgot. I once had an instance on Amazon that I created, I think, in 2006, and I was being built, built for it for like $10 a month, and I never bothered to go find out what I was built for. And then in 2015 or so, I went and I found out the instance was still running. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why Amazon was billing me for it. But, um, but so yes, you could have those kind of uptimes, years, uh, sometimes 10 years or so. But, and ZOS is also has great uptime and certainly you're able to keep this up for a very long time. Uh, you can also see here, as you can see, I spoke that there is also Unix system services on the ZOS, which is the, a part of subsystem of ZOS that work, is, is actually Unix compatible and even POSIX compatible. And, uh, and so you can see all the processes running under that. There's an FTP daemon, there's an SSH daemon server, there's a resolver, a web server, and stuff like that. So, um, so now, one big difference is that when I run uh, uh, a compilation, for instance, right? if I want to do, do I have a C command, uh, a C program here? I don't. Um, I don't. But, um, right, uh, any commands that I run, uh, the output is going to be, of course, immediately uh, interactive on the, on the shell, on the screen here. Whereas uh, some commands that you run in ZOS, they actually run in batch, which means that the output they produce is going to be written to something that's called the spool, okay? ZOS systems, when, whenever you execute the batch program, uh, the, the, you will have to go look at the output. Either it comes out on a printer and then it will somehow be forwarded to you by email or somehow, or you'll have to go look at for the output in what's called the spool. And that's one area where a lot of developers, a lot of people who are new to the mainframe ZOS uh, kind of struggle with. So I'm going to show this here. Um, let me see if I have here any. Uh, okay, so you have a job that reformats um, a subsystem of ZOS which keeps track of all the errors that happen within the system, either in hardware and software, and writes them to a temporary file called the environmental uh, recorder, uh, which just records everything. And so, which I wish Linux had. And so I can actually uh, run this. Okay, and if I put in here the user that I'm that I'm running this as, uh, and then I put in here message class H in this system, that's a installation defined 
class, message class. There's message classes that go to printers and, and certain printers. So you can have 10, 15, 100 printers and each message class will go to a different printer. Or you can say held output, which means it goes to spool. So why don't we do that here? Let's run this program. Uh, it wants a job name character. Just because my user is Moshix, uh, usually it wants one more additional character so I can keep the the outputs that are going to show up in the spool, I'm going to show you in a second, apart from each other. So let's start with A. Okay, so this ran. And of course, the first thing you notice is that it came back with a maximum condition code of 000. zero, zero. So uh, everything has a condition code in the mainframe. And Linux has some of that, but it's really... A lot of it, it depends on the implementation by the program. If there's a programmer, you port the condition code. As you just saw previously, I wrote a tiny little C program on the mainframe. Uh, and the first thing is that I would I would have a ret uh, return zero. So you can do that as a programmer on Linux, but you you don't have to. Uh, whereas on the mainframe, everything is reported back. The, the system reports the condition code. So this went through well. Now, how do I see the output from this? This created an output, right? And you can see it here from sysprint. Oops, actually went to A. Oops. Uh, so let's run this again. I'm hard on running it again. Okay, uh, B this time. So it ran. And of course, again, um, condition code zero. Now I want to look at the output from this program that I ran. So I can start here a different session. I go to this pool systems display and search facility you're going to be spending a lot of time here in this subsystem if you're going to work in the mainframe so get familiar with it and then i go to the held output queue here this one okay and you can see here there is a job which are called 762 moshix b that's the one we just ran and it's held it's local and it has 71 records in 71 lines so let's go look at it we say s for selection and now we can see that this job ran. Now, the one thing that we have to understand, the one big difference, and this is a really a giant difference between ZOS and Linux, is that when I run a command here, um, let's say I create command.bash, and I say um, l l show me what's in what's in, in a temporary uh, uh, file, a uh, directory. So now I can say bash command. And so it, the command was executed and they chose me here. Now, you actually, whatever you execute, go straight to the kernel, the nucleus of the, the kernel of, the, of Linux, and it, it schedules it for execution. The address space is started. The program that you want to load is loaded, in this case, bash, as you can see here, and then with the command, with the argument command bash, and then bash will load and it will load in this uh, file and then pass an execution to and execute the file the commands that are inside this command.bash file it's and then returns back to the shell uh, and so zos is quite different here everything that executes will have to go to something called jest2 and jest2 stands for job entry subsystem 2 and they call it 2 because there used to be a 1 uh, jest1 which very few people know about, and there was part of OS VS1. And there's also JS3 to this day, which is a different job entry subsystem. What a job entry subsystem does is it, it handles spool. Spool means that um, a collection of either input that needs to be processed or a collection of output that has been processed and is now just like this, this output here that we're looking at, and it's going get, to get written onto a spool volume, okay? or a spool area, sub area of the volume. And and a lot of people struggle at the beginning that why is everything going through JS2? I mean, isn't there a, a kernel and nucleus in ZOS? Yes, there is, but the ZOS kernel or the MVS kernel is only, or the nucleus as it's properly called, only concerns itself with running address spaces. Uh, how the input goes to those address spaces and how the output is processed and in what order they're going to be executed and who has access to what and which user can schedule what at what time and to which printer and which tapes and which resources it's going to use all that is left to the scheduling subsystem called jest2 so jest2 is a scheduling subsystem and a spool handler or both functions in one and everything that you do will always end up going through what you see here 
is just to job log. Okay, so that's one thing to understand. Um, so that's how uh, you get the basic things done. So we saw ls. We saw uh, now. How do you show the contents of a file? So let's do more more shakes favorite movie. So that's how you would do it with more or less uh, favorite movies, right? Um, that's how you would do it uh, in or cat more shakes. Okay, so that's how you would do it in Linux, um, similar in Windows, I guess. And how do we do this on ZOS? So in ZOS, um, there's several ways to do it. I think the easiest would be because very often when you show the content of a file, first you want to look at the directory, right? So very often the more or less or the cat commands are preceded by an ls, right? So so therefore it makes sense to go to 3.4, the dataset list utility that we've used at the very beginning of this video and start from there. So let's say we put in here uh, Moshix, right? And so now I want to look at the content of this uh, of some files so I would now say here E for edit or B for browse sorry browse and so now it shows me what's inside so that will be the the equivalent of cat or less or more right so if I put in a B it's it only opens for viewing but not for editing if I put in an E it will also allow me to edit it now as you can see here you have Oh yeah, these numbers. What is that? So in ZOS, you have the formatting, the printer formatting commands embedded in the file. And it sounds strange to have these commands, but actually it makes handling output much, much better. Uh, printing on Linux, Unix, and Windows is still a mess. Uh, you need drivers, and every application handles it differently. And printing has never been a strength of either Unix, Linux, or Windows. Printing has been a great strength of ZOS ever since the earliest days, 50 years ago. And so one means advance, so print this line and advance, and Z means don't advance. So there's several commands here, which you can just uh, disregard by going right one. Okay, and so I type right one and now they disappear. So I could change this now and put in here make mouse if I wanted to. Uh, but I want to, so I have to write cancel, and so and so that's it. So this is how you would uh, look at commands. Now, one thing to understand, and I mentioned this before when we created the data set, is that the, you know the Linux and any Unix data set um, file system is hierarchical, which means that you start at the top, and then you can go to one directory down, and then you can go to one yet one more directory down. Etc. Right. So you can see here we're now in root lib lsb. So we're two levels down from root, and so that means that the file system is hierarchical, and you can have endless, uh, an endless tree going down many many levels. Right. And that, that uh, what is that? Why is that? Because that's really an organizational feature of the file system of any Unix or Windows or, or Linux. Now the file system on ZOS doesn't have and that may come as a big surprise for many is not an hierarchical file system at all uh, so how do you organize things so in zos there is something called partition data set so if i go and create a new data set i can decide to call it moshix uh, favorite and things okay i allocate there it wants to go there i don't know and I call it MB megabyte, one megabyte, no secondary. And now I can have to, I can say something called directory block. So I say 20 directory blocks. Bracket format, I'll choose again fixed block, 80, and then um, block size. And I can either write here PDS, partition data set, or library. On MVS, older MVS, such as we run on, on uh, for older systems you only have PDS newer systems have something called library but they're very very similar except they're not the same uh, but just let's disregard it for a moment so I'm going to make a library as you can see your data set allocated now if I go here to 3.4 you can see 
that um, there is this data set. So this data set now is special because as you can see, it's a library. So it's a data set that it contain, can contain other files inside it. And so that is kind of like having an hierarchical file system. But again, it's not because it's really just one data set that inside has an organization that allows you to create some files inside. But it's not really a subdirectory or a sub part of the general file system. So the file system in, in ZOS is, uh, is very, very different. And also a lot of the automation and implicit functions that come with Linux or Windows are totally absent in ZOS. So like you have to specify the size. If you want to increase them, that's not that easy. You first have to create a new one, make them bigger, and then copy all the contents from the old file. So a lot of the stuff that will look arcane to you, but there is a reason why they're like this. And the reason is that this is for production where a lot of planning goes into before executing anything. And generally you will see that the philosophies of, of ZOS and Linux, uh, one of the big distinctions there is that uh, you try things in Linux and Windows and Unix until you make it work. And there's a lot of trial and error versus on the ZOS because those run big production systems for centralized applications for government, banks, big insurance companies. It, it's it's not okay in, in a professional organization to try things and see how it works. And you, you plan for it and you do it right the first time, if, if at all possible. And so some of the implicit things that go with Linux don't don't make any sense in, a, in an operating system like ZOS. Anyway, let's look at some more commands. Um, so uh, we were looking at files, of course, in uh, in Unix. Let's go into new directory. So making directory is the same like creating a new partition data set as we just saw. Now, uh, if we just say touch Moshix, we'll have now a new file here called Moshix. If I want to rename it, we would say Moshix to Moshix new. So how do we rename things? Um, let's go here and, um, and on our mainframe and see how we can re rename things. So uh, one way to rename it is to put in here the select selector. And then you can see here we have number six is rename. So we could just call it something else, but let me just first find something else to, well, okay, let's rename this. We can also just write rename here. Uh, we call it Moshik's favorite stuff. So now if we go to refresh, we'll see that, uh, oh, yeah. I should have put in quotes around it. So if you don't put in quotes, it'll assume that the high level qualifier is your username and that's what happened. So let's fix this. So you can put in the selector and then we can put in the name. See, in this case it already puts the quotes around it. So we we'll just remove this and make it like that. As you can see here, um, it's already updated it. So now it's Moshik's favorite stuff. So that's renaming, right? If I want to delete stuff here, of course, in um, in Linux, I would say remove. And the same for either a file, right? I could either say delete here, or I can just take the selector and say um, five, delete, right? Um, that's, uh, that applies both to a partition data set, which is kind of like a directory, but not really, as well as to the as to a single member inside a partition data set. Maybe a little bit of history about partition data set. The reason why partition data sets were created, and that's very important to understand, is not to create an illusion of a hierarchical file system. The simple reason why partition sets were created in the 70s by IBM is that they saw that when people were using sequential data sets, basically just files, a lot of space uh, was going wasted. And so they thought of a way to, uh, to reclaim some of the wasted space by creating partition data sets so that you could actually write different files or members inside the same data set. And that's the, that's the motivation for partition data sets. So it's not to create a hierarchical file system. So to this day, there's really no hierarchical file system 
on the ZOS file systems. Uh, again, every modern ZOS and um, even some older MVS versions have a Unix subsystem that's called USS and in there you would have uh, some of that. And I think maybe now is a good time to actually go into that, right? Um, if you go here, uh, there's going to be a place where I don't know if on this machine I have shell. Yeah, so oh, oh, there's one way. So you can do O shell, which is kind of a, a way to browse the Unix file system. For instance, here. Okay, so I'm browsing now. As you can see, this is typical Unix notation. There is also another way to do it, which is to go to a real shell. Um, what is it called? I haven't been there in such a long time. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Maybe from here. Yes, OMBS is a command which gives you a kind of a Unix shell, so very similar to the one we have on this side. Let's make this a little bit smaller. Um, also, let me make the font just a tiny bit smaller here. I know you don't like that, but sometimes it's just impossible to work with a font that's too big. Yeah, let's go to 12. Okay. So, um, so this is a very similar environment to this, right? So I can type in, but this is not the same data that we're looking at. And that's important to understand. This is a completely different file system. There's different data here than on the file system we looked at before. But if I type ls, you can see here I have, um, I have uh, just Linux commands. So I can now say uh, more hello.c. And it will output the content of this file on the screen. Now it's just the same like doing here. Hello, Moshix. Well, let me do here. Hello.c. So we have some environments. And let's just, for the sake of it, try to copy this. I don't know if this is going to work. I never tried it this way. Yeah. So that actually worked beautifully, except for problem here okay so we have the exact same environment here all right so uh, we could now do compile it and, uh, metal compiler there's a C compiler but it's called differently I think it's called like this yes um, and they need some libraries that the environments need and the environment needs to be set up, which it is not. But you could just compile just the same. So you can see here, once you're in the Unix uh, um, subsystem here, Unix uh, uh, services, it, it becomes very, very similar to any Linux you would know. Right? Here we just say hello, and that's the end of it, right? And now we would have two objects here. And it will be just the same here on this on this machine, but this is uh, this is different. This is the Unix uh, subsystem, and um, and of course you don't need my help here to navigate around around um, uh, Unix on any platform. So we can just leave here now and uh, quit, exit, and we go back to here, right? And so as I just said. SPF is the panel subsystem. The data in the file systems are not the same. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to find that hello just by going to the to the uh, to the file system for ZOS. However, there is a way that I can actually look at that data, and I can even edit it by going to u moshix hello dot c. This should be possible. Yes, here it is. So we can even access Unix file system here from from the uh, from the editor itself, just like any other file. Okay, we save it. 
So by putting it here, it says other partition sequential or reason or zero as a Unix file, as you can see here. Right, that is also possible. So this gives you a very quick and very high level um, way to start working on ZOS and get around with the Unix and Linux commands you know. Obviously, there's so many more commands um, that uh, that exist here that don't make any sense in an operating system like ZOS and vice versa. One more thing I want to say here at the end is that everything that we have done so far, absolutely everything that we've done on the ZOS terminal, we could also do in batch, right? And what do I mean by batch? If I go here and I pick up, um, let me see if I have, yeah, this would be, um, so this is a way to copy files from a sequential data set into a partition data set, right? And um, and we can see here we're doing this in, in batch with a program called I, I, IEB, which is all IEB programs are part of the tools uh, that come with the operating system and then patch. Um, so that would be an example of uh, something that we can do in batch. We could also do it probably online, um, I mean interactively. And there is many tools, there's maybe a collection of 20, 30 tools out there, IEB copy and many others. Let's see what this is. Um, there's another batch utility to um, to dump data for backups. Let me see what else we find here. Um, there's a little program I wrote to show how uh, the time works on ZOS and MVS. I started making a video about it, but I don't know if people are really that interested in knowing how the timer works in, in the mainframe. It's really quite different than, than Unix and Windows. But anyway, so, uh, so as you can see here, these are all batch uh, programs. So you start those and they run independently of any monitor of any screen in the background. Kind of like kind of like in Linux you could do like find name Mushix, right? And uh, this is now gonna start and go in the background and I can do control Z and as you can see here it stopped it now and then I do here background and so now as you can see jobs, right? It's now running in the background. So this will be, it's now become a batch job and exactly the same thing here. Now this is not connected to a terminal um, and I can continue doing my stuff exactly the same idea here and it's actually now done. And I have the jobs command and, and they call those jobs because actually the idea of jobs come from the mainframe world. So this is an overview, um, very, very simple, just the bare minimum to get you started. Obviously, if you start working on ZOS or MPS, you will then have to learn uh, more, quite a bit more. But I have 115 other videos in this channel and you'll find probably another 20, 30, 40 videos uh, in YouTube about how to work with, uh, with ZOS. Um, and so but there's definitely enough information there to get started. But this is really the bare minimum to impress your friends at work and to your boss so that you can show that you can, uh, you can get by on the mainframe. So this is it. If you have any questions, please post comments below this video. Um, and um, I try to answer all comments as well as the community at large is very active on, the, on, on answering comments. There is also a channel on a chat um, system. I can never remember the name of it. Um, maybe somebody will post the name of it in, below this video, but there is a chat channel that I set up maybe a year ago or so. And, the, and the people there will answer questions or we also have a Facebook channel called the Moshiks mainframe, mainframe channel on Facebook. And But comments are the fastest way to get somebody's reaction. If you like this particular video, do press the thumbs up button. And if you haven't subscribed yet to the Moshiks mainframe channel, now would be a good time to go do it. Thank you for watching and goodbye.